you have a chart. Up here, you've got this chart like this. It's one side is one thing, and the other side is the other thing. Someone had one of these the other day, and it was printed only on one side of my machine. The printer messed up, so anyway, I had to give him another half of it. But we started studying church history and religious history. <coughs> now, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. Barashith bara. All right? Elohim. Eth Hashemayim with Eth Aretz. In the beginnings, plural, God created the heavens and the earth. Before he ever created the heavens and the earth, he created spirits, didn't he? Ruach. And angels. Well, some of those angels and spirits rebelled against him. And we've had a controversy ever since. God created man. And in Hebrew, and Leanne's our Hebrew teacher, by the way, here. Hebrew is a beautiful language, and in the original language, it's a language of action and power. It says God created man as he created the dust of the ground and breathed, the him, breathed in him the breathing of his lives. And he stood upon his feet, said he took a Isha from Ish, woman from man, he put them back together in marriage. They sinned against God. And God restored them back to fellowship with Him by way of sacrifices. But He said in Genesis 3.15 that He would send a Messiah. The first child they had name was what? It's Tesnite. This is Tesnite. What was their first child's name? Cain. What does Cain mean? Uh, what does Cain mean? Come on. Huh? Come on. You guys, what does Cain mean? Brother Bill, you remember that one? Maryland. He who huh? He who shall. No, no Cain. What? Gotten. Aha. Uh -huh. And what he said in Hebrew, we have gotten a man, even the Lord. They thought the Messiah was born. Well, there was some religious persecution there, wasn't there? All right, we talked about this here a little bit. We're recapping. I'm doing this for Leanne because she hasn't been here. We're going to go through this real fast, Leanne. So you have to just grab all this stuff real fast and just as you go by. All right, and Cain sinned against God. How did he sin against God? Two ways. He brought the wrong amount and the wrong type. All right. God, as far as we know, is always... Uh, required a, a, a tithe and he brought the wrong amount and he brought the wrong sacrifice and God said to him what? if you'll consider if you'll bring the right if you'll what was the term? if you'll bring the right amount if you'll number this right, if you'll divide it correctly, okay? If you'll divide what you have correctly, won't you be happy? And no, he didn't want to do it. And he said, sin is laying at your door like a sneaking wolf or a cat ready to catch you. Well, he, he sinned, didn't he? He did not want to do that. He was a cheapskate, a tightwad, and he wanted to do things his own way. And that's like the religious world. Now, there's always been worship, hasn't there? Man was made. There's something in every man that he wants to worship something. There is a void there that cannot be filled by anything but God. In angels and spirits, evidently there is the same thing. But in Satan, and his name was what? Originally. Lucifer. All right. What does Lucifer mean? Light carrier. Light carrier. All right. In Lucifer, he there was pride. He was a perfect being, but there was pride. And he tried to rise above God, and he tried to overthrow God. And one-third of the spiritual forces and one-third of the angelic forces, from what we can understand from Scriptures, rebelled against God. But here... Now, in the age of conscience that we're talking about, 
we have the real first in the human time we have the first rise of false religion in Cain not only false religion but when false religion rises up we always have religious persecution somebody's always wanting to kill somebody else the truth you don't have to do anything simple you just preach the truth and let let the mob flop okay but those out there that are not preaching the truth, they get offended and they want to hurt you. All right? And that's what happened there in the, in the early garden. I'm sure that if there was a sacrificial altar that God himself had put together, Adam had taught his sons how to come to God, how to worship God on that altar, and what to bring, and how much to bring. Well, it didn't happen. Now, Cain never was threatened ever by Abel, was he? Remember that? Who was the heir? Who was supposed to be the spiritual leader? The firstborn. All right? The firstborn was Cain. Abel could have never supplanted Cain at all because he was the heir. All right? But when he killed his brother Abel, it says in Hebrew that the bloods cried out from the ground. His bloods cried out from the ground. And God came and says... Uh, Abel or Cain, what have you done? And that's where he said, I'm not my brother's keeper, which we are our brother's keepers, aren't we? Well, from that point of time on, then God appointed Zeth. What does Zeth mean in Hebrew? Huh? What, what does it mean? Substitute. Substitute. All right, substitute. And then we have the ten names, the ten inspired names in the Old Testament. As we go on, and every one of those names teaches something in, in, in history. All right? Well, we have uh, mankind. After this time, he was supposed to do good and offer blood sacrifice, and there was wickedness. And with wickedness came the judgment of the universal flood. And then when Noah got off the ark, by the way, was Noah the only preacher that, that uh, prophesied the flood? Who had preached it for 300 years before him? Enoch. He preached basically the same thing. He even named his son Methuselah. The judgment was coming. If you don't repent, we preach today. I preached on hell this morning. How many of you were here this morning? All right. Preached on hell this morning. We just got there in the Bible in the 20th chapter of Revelation. We're just finishing Revelation. So we came upon the subject of hell. When you preach hellfire and brim nation, you hope they repent and come to the Lord and serve Him. Well, Enoch preached. What does the name Enoch mean in Hebrew? See, these are beautiful little things. What's Enoch? You should have brought my other book. Well, see, I want you to learn these things. What's Enoch mean? Teacher. What? Teacher. That's what Enoch means, teacher. Now, he named his son Methuselah. What does Methuselah mean? When he, is, when he dies... When he, when he is dead, it shall come to pass. Now, not only did he name him Methuselah, but he says when this boy dies, the flood, the, that year the flood is going to come and there's going to be judgment from God. You have to remember, it had never rained on the earth before. There were sources of water at uh, that period of time. There was an ocean in the sky. Now today we got a little water out of the sky. Now if you wanted, how many, how much water do you think fell on the Bakersfield area here in the southern San Joaquin Valley? Now, how much water does it take to do that to spread it all over? How much? A few hundred thousand gallons, a few acre feet of water to do what it did. Now God put that up in the sky, didn't He? We have clouds up there, and it comes down, it forms uh, raindrops and falls, and we see that today. But at this period of time, that didn't happen. What was the main source of water on the earth, if you wanted drinking water? What happened? Springs and dew. The earth was totally surrounded by a ocean of water all around the earth. The, out, the earth was like a a God-made greenhouse. And, every, and the, every night the dew would come up and water everything. There was no reason to water everything. Your drinking water was the springs. 
of water. Okay, well, God, when He brought judgment on the earth, the first time they ever heard lightning and thunder was then. God rained on the earth and deluged the earth with three sources. Remember what they were? Water from the ground. Water from underground, the springs of the deep, the pig A from the deep, and what else? Water. What? Water from the clouds. The okay, sky. the ocean and the floodgates of heaven were opened. There was great rivers running down from heavens to earth. God started dumping the water down in rivers on the earth. Okay? You ever heard this before, Leanne? Yeah. You've heard you've heard some of this before? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking at some of those names because those are not the names in my strong concordance. Oh. What, let me ask you real quickly. What did you say the name, the, the word Cain meant? In Hebrew? Cain means gotten. Gotten, received. Gotten. Strong concordance says it means a spirit, a land. And, and the, the country, well, see, in, in Hebrew, you know, it's a limited language. Yeah, so okay. It, you have to go back from there, and it needs to get. If you spear something, you got it, don't you? Okay. If you spear a fish, you got it. Got it. And what did you say Enoch meant? Enoch meant teacher. Teacher. Okay. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. 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 It means brief, I think. Yeah, yeah brief. I think it means brief. <coughs> brief. Short. Transitional, short, brief. Okay. All right. <coughs> Where was I? With the, with the sources of water. Judgment. God always sends judgment when, when sin needs to be stopped. All right. Well, the judgment <coughs> here was a universal flood. We had the rivers from the, the ground were opened up. The floodgates of heaven were opened. And it began to rain. And <coughs> already God had put Noah in the ark. The ark is what? Type of the second coming. The days of Noah is the type of the second coming of the Lord. On this chart again, you see that that all those that are saved in the church age will be caught up to be with the Lord. Like in the ark. Now, <clears throat> during the tribulation period, there are going to be a tremendous number of people saved. Aren't there? According to what it talks about in the book of Revelation, there's going to be a lot of people saved. But what's going to happen to them? They're going to have to die a martyr's death. That's just the way it is. Okay? Now, in the days of the flood, I believe on the outside of the ark there was a lot of people saved. But it's too late because that's a type of the second coming. On the outside of the ark, there was no way in. Once the rapture takes place, you're not going to go to heaven. You're not going to get out of the judgment that comes upon the earth. That judgment is predetermined and foreordained to happen. Okay? It's going to happen. And if you didn't believe before, it's too late to get on the boat. All right? It's too late to get on the boat in the ark. Well, everybody on the outside of the ark died. Now we have a God-established human government. Now, what is a human government supposed to do according to these responsibilities and all of this here? Supposed to protect people from each other, isn't it? All right, that's what government's supposed to do. Protect people from each other. What else? Protect government from man. And protect man from the government. <laughs> as simple as it is. That's real simple. And that's when the death penalty was uh, instituted. That's uh, uh, actually the law of Moses over here, you know. They actually knew a lot about this law already. God had already instilled it into them. All it was is written down in stone here. It was oral here, but it was written in stone here for Israel to bring to the world. Well, God uh, told them to scatter and multiply. What did they do? They congregated. And they scattered, they congregated, and built a great city. That city was named Confusion, Babylon. And from Babylon, what happened? The judgment. The confusion, the language, and I wish they'd have put down here the division of the earth. In the days of Peleg, God divided the earth. Peleg is the word that, in Hebrew, that the word Pharisees comes from, isn't it? Pharez. What does that mean? Separated, divided. 
All right, set apart. All right. So the continents were set apart and divided during that period of time. And the confusion of languages. That's when we have all the continents came apart. Not only did what would they build that great big tower out of in the big city? What was it made out of? Stone. It was made out of bricks, and they had mortar, and they put it in there, and they used the tar for mortar. But anyway, they built this great tower, and it was finished, uh, completed action, and then God judged it. And they had built these great stone buildings and this big edifice here to worship God, or Nimrod, at their God, because man is religious in it. So that void there is going to be replaced by something. It's either going to be replaced by truth or error. Now, error always persecutes truth, doesn't it? It always has. God divided the earth. He told them not to build cities, but scatter and multiply. If you lived on the earth at that period of time, the earth was shaking. They didn't build any more buildings for a while. It shook them real good. Real good. Well... There aren't very many edifices standing that long in time, are there? Let's think about some of it. Go back to that period of time. How many edifices are standing? Possibly the Sphinx. The The Sphinx of Egypt, as far as we know, that's the only building that is still standing on the other side of the flood. Okay? The judgment that happened here in the division of the earth. It was all shook down. And uh, old Napoleon decided to shoot the nose off the Sphinx. Tore up all. You know, those pyramids of Egypt were beautiful when he came along there. What were they covered with? They weren't just pyramids. What were they covered with? Alabaster. They shone like glass mirrors on all of this, those. Did you know that, Leah? Beautiful. They took all of that off and, and exported it to Europe. And, and anyway, it, it was greatly defaced from what it originally was. The pyramids were beautiful at one time. Beautiful. All right, so now the houses are shook down. Nobody's able to build a big city at that time. They're scattered. God's forcing them to scatter, except they're still they're gang, ganging together in gangs still, aren't they? Men using other men. What was the curse that God put upon man? What was work. All right, you shall, you shall make your bread or your living by what? The sweat of your... What is in Hebrew? Nostrils. When you bend over and you are working, the sweat runs off the end of your nose. That's the lowest thing on your head, so that's where it runs off. And that's what it says in Hebrew, off the end of your nose, your nostrils. All right? Well, how did Cain later on and how did uh, Nimrod, how did they get around this curse? Slavery was invented slavery. Men causing many men to work for them. And so that's how they tried to get around the curse. Uh, thumbing their nose at God. Saying that they could overcome. Now we have promise. Genesis the 12th chapter. God told Abraham to, to uh, dwell in Canaan. And what did Abraham do? According to your little chart there. What did he do? We're getting over here to where we're going. Over here to the church. Alright. What did Abraham do? Went, went to Egypt. Hmm? Went to Egypt. He went in down into Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is a type of what? The world. The world. Alright. And God told us to trust in Him, not in the world. Okay? And He went into the world to get His substance. And God told him to not do that. God cursed back at this period of time when when Noah's three sons, God cursed one of those boys through through Noah. What was that boy's name that had this curse on him? Canaan. Canaan was his name. Now, eventually, they went in and founded the land of Canaan. All right? This is Canaan land where God was going to give this to, to Abraham. God had them people go over there and they were slaves. A lot of, I mean, Southern Baptists, you heard the term Southern Baptists. We're going to talk about Baptists. We're going to talk about the good things and the bad things about Baptists. We're just going to tell the truth and lay it all out on the table. 
One thing about Southern Baptist, the word Southern Baptist is what? Southern. Where do you think they were mainly? In the South. In the South. All right, in the South. Did they believe in slavery? Did they? Yes. They practiced and they believed in slavery. You know, Baptists ought to take the Word of God and divide it correctly. They had not divided the Word of God correctly, and they had this idea that this this curse that was placed upon man was blackness, along with the Mormons. You know, they had the same idea, you know, that anybody was dark, they were cursed. And they were cursed into slavery, although they were supposed to work for the others. Well, we find out that the, the curse that was actually put on here, well, the curse was put upon not Ham. God, if, if Noah would have cursed Ham, he would have cursed himself. But one descendant of Ham's and Ham's family was Canaan, Canaan Lamb. Now, God knew beforehand what those boys would act like. They would be rascals and scoundrels down in that land. And God was going to go allow them to go into that land. He was going to build, they were going to build farms and homes and all this kind of stuff. And then God was going to give it to Shem. We have Ham, Shem, and Japheth. All right. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, Shem was going to go down there. Now, who are the descendants of Shem? Abraham. What? Arabs and Jews. Arabs and Jews. All right. There's a Shem. Shem means really means name. All right, means name. All right, name. Now our monuments. So they would be the people that would carry the name of God. All right, in this land. Now the curse that God placed upon Canaan over here would hundreds of years later be really taking effect here and even here. All right. Now understand, God doesn't just do something one time in history. There is a long plan. And it's laid out solidly. So God said over here what would happen in here in this period of time. Are you following me? All right. Now I know we. Yes, brother. What does the word king, uh, the name king mean? I can't remember right now. There's a. Uh, Look it up for you really quickly. Canaan was also in the good line. Is it purchased or redeemed? I think it is. I think something like that. It means, yeah, purchase or redeemer. Our redeemer. All right, Canaan. Purchase. All right. Through the children of Canaan, the Canaanites, God would purchase the land for them also. As you see that. Through our Lord, He purchases our salvation. Then, all right, in a double way. All right. So that name was really important. Thank you for asking that question, brother. Had to look it up. Couldn't remember it, but had it down there. Now, God is going to give this land here, the land of Canaan, to Abraham and his descendants. Now, Abraham's descendants are going to be twofold in two ways. There are two categories of his descendants. One of them is like the stars of heaven. They'll be like the stars of heaven. And the other one is like the sand of the sea. Now, if you look at this carefully, you find that the stars of heaven are those spiritual seed of Abraham. And the sands of the sea, there are many physical seed of Abraham in the world today. You're probably even related to them somehow or another. Do you know that? You go back a 50 or 75 generations, you're going to be related to a lot of people. You'll find out. All right. Well, the promise. Now in the, I believe it is the 20th chapter. We're kind of clipping along here now. Go to Genesis, the 20th chapter. Twenty-second chapter. Look at Genesis. I'll try to share Greek and Hebrew with you wherever we are in the Bible. Okay. And of course, so far, I've mainly been revealing some things from the Hebrew language that's very beautiful that you miss in the translations. All right. Now, God, when God called Abraham, his name wasn't Abraham, was it? 
All right, what was it? Abram. Abram. And what does Abram mean in Hebrew? Exalted Father. Mm-hmm. What's, the fifth le- what's the fifth letter in the Hebrew language? It. All right. All right. That's the fifth one, H. What did God add to Abraham's name? The hey. All right. The number of grace. That's what he added to him. His name went from exalted father to a father of a great multitude. Ham, him, Abraham. All right. At the end, that means plural stuff in it. All right. Like Hashemayim. Mayim. Huh? That's he sure, sure did the same thing. She became princess until a mother of princes. Many princes. All right. Change her name. Put that het in her name and expanded what they were. They also changed. Did you know that? They were changed. God gave them new names. What's God going to do to those in the, in, the, in the eternal ages? Up in glory. They're going to have new names. We're going to have new names. Just think about that. Now, God gave Abraham a new name. He's going to give us a new name also. All right. Beautiful things. Uh, truths that, uh, that are established in the Word of God and just don't die. All right. They are really there for a purpose. And you'll see it over and over repeated. In the, in the plagues in the book of Revelation, what do you find? Is that exactly what happens over here in the Egyptian bondage? Because Abraham sinned against God and went down into Egypt, God told Abraham he cursed his descendants. What did he tell him? What he tell him was going to happen to his descendants because he had this Ishmael? No, to his all his descendants. Well, they're going to be in bondage for four hundred years. They're going to be in bondage for four hundred years because does your sins affect your children? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. And it did for 400 years. All right. It affected those children, the Egyptian bondage. And then God raised up Moses. And what does Moses mean? Huh? Moses. To draw out. All right. What did Moses do to eat, to eat to Israel? He drew them out of Egyptian bondage and he's going to bring them back into the promised land. Alright? Now, Yahshua. Isn't that a beautiful name, Yahshua? In the New Testament, the translation is known as what? Jesus. Jesus. What does that mean? In Hebrew. Jehovah saves. You know what? I have a long standing statement that Jesus in the New Testament is Yeshua, which means salvation. Yep. Yehoshua is what you just said. Mm-hmm. So there's another vowel in there, and, and, and that drives me nuts every time I say that, because Je- Joshua is not Jesus. It's Yeshua versus Yehoshua. Mm-hmm. So, but it's, it's somewhere in the Bible, I think someone mentioned it's, it's so similar, it's so close. But when you put that other vowel in there, Yehoshua, uh-huh. and when you said it was God, what was it again? Jehovah saves. Yeah, because yeah. Yah is God, yeah. Yeshua is always repentance or salvation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So but it's very curious because when you look at the exact Hebrew of the New Testament, it will say Yeshua, uh-huh. which means he will save. So he raised up one to love. That's what's exciting when that angel comes down and tells Mary, mm-hmm. you shall call his name Jesus. That doesn't mean anything in English, but when he said it to her in her language, which probably was Hebrew, mm-hmm. he said you will call him Yeshua Joshua. because he will save his They people. still were using the Hebrew name. And, they still, and that's third person singular for the future. Yes, mm-hmm. she was that one. Yes, yep. mm-hmm. he will say he will. So anyway, I've never yep. understood why they always say that. If it's a type of, you, sh, you know, because all the Messianic Jews today, they say Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus the Messiah. Messiah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, the whole point is that Yeshua, yeah, Joshua is very close, but it's mm-hmm. not the identical. Yeah, it's not. The root is there. Yeah. The root is there. The but the real deal. Now, Joshua was a type of Jesus because he leads them. Can you put that on the board? The spelling and the meaning of what you just went over? So I can copy it down. All right. <laughs> you want to come up here and put it up here? No. All right. Okay, Joshua. All right. I 
saying something like that. Yahshua HaMashiach. Now, the name for Joshua is what? Joshua in the Old Testament. God saves, right? Yeah, God saves. All right. Uh, Joshua. Now, Joshua, and that's the one we have in, in the New Testament now. This means Jehovah saves. He shall save. Jehovah shall save. It's kind of a futuristic thing. Jehovah shall save. We did look in the book of James the other day, and we saw a future perfect when we looked at the, the glory of God in the, in the book, because there was a Hebrew or a Hebraism in the book of James that told us this. Remember that? So Yeshua HaMashiach means Jesus, means, or uh, the one who uh, Jehovah shall save, the Messiah. Jesus is, they, it specifies that he is Yahshua. All right. What does the, the ha mean? On the, 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 okay. the Messiah. And actually, the Hebrew is Mashiach with a C-H on the end. Uh-huh. But all the Arabs will say Mashiach. Yeshua HaMashiach. You don't do that. That yeah. Does it make a difference in the meaning? Or no, it means the anointed one. Yeah, the anointed one. Yeshua, you could say today that um, um, John is going to say to his people, and he say, Yohanan, Yeshua, Ha'am. John is going to say to his people because all Yeshua means is he will say. That's all it means. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He will say, but he'll say what is his people. He'll say yeah, he shall people. save his people. All right. Anyway, these are those names. Let's get on a little bit further. Running along here. Now, we were about in here last week when we stopped, weren't we? All right. Somewhere around in here. Well, God brought Israel out of Egypt. But they weren't worthy, were they? Were they worthy of God's love? How do we know that? They disobeyed. Well, they disobeyed him. Now, just think about this. Now, who did all the miracles? In Egypt, who performed the Israel? I mean, who performed the miracles in Egypt before Pharaoh? Who was the man that did it? Aaron. Moses didn't do it. Aaron did it. He stood there and he performed the miracles. Now, in the background, Moses stood. He didn't do the talking. Aaron did all the talking. All right. Whose rod was that that was thrown down? It wasn't Moses' rod. It was Aaron's rod. All right. He's a spokesman. Aaron's a spokesman, not Moses. All right. Moses, again, is a type of God, too. And Aaron is a prophet. Now, they, uh, they come out of the land of Egypt. They get over there in Sinai. And, uh, did you have a question, Bob? No. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> All right. They get over there at Sinai. And uh, God, goes, uh, God meets with Moses now. Now, who's down at the foot of the mountain? Aaron. Aaron's down at the foot of the mountain. Who was the prophet? What well, Moses? Aaron was the prophet. Now, Moses is looked upon as the prophet in Israel. All right, the prophet. Okay? But Aaron was a prophet. Now, he's down there supposed to be controlling the people while Moses is up there talking with God. All right? He's a direct representative. Moses is a direct representative of God among these people. All right? So, Aaron's down there. And they're out there carousing around and hollering and going on. And they say, uh, make us a God we can see. Now, in false religion, the world has always wanted a God they can see and a religion they can feel. So guess what they got? A God they could see and a religion they feel because they were really excited about it. They were, they were just hooping and hollering down there around that golden calf. And who made the golden calf for them? Aaron, the goldsmith among them. Aaron's job was he was a goldsmith. And there are people in Aaron's line today, they say, they live on a, is it the island of Cyprus? In the, uh, that where these people, I can't remember their name. They've got, they are all golds and silversmiths there in that area. You remember, you know who they are? Yeah, I can't think of it, but yeah. Levine? I think their name is Levine. Uh, all of the tribe of Levi, Aaron's descendants. All right. They're all gold and silversmiths. Guess what? Who was their grandpa? Aaron. Who made the calf? Aaron did. The Lord said, you better get down off the mountain there, Moses, and go down there and look and see what's going on down there below. Now, I know Cecil B. Neville didn't quite get this all right. 
But uh, he did a beautiful picture there. It just wasn't quite correctly. I mean, Moses didn't do the miracles. And, and now here comes uh, Moses down off the mountain with the tablets of the law. All right. When he gets down there, he's mad. And he throws the law down and he literally breaks the, the, the first man to break the law of God. Literally. Okay? He breaks the law and instantly judgment comes. And people start dying, don't they? Well, how many of these people died that were there on the place today before they got to the promised land? How many of them did? All, all the living ones. All of the living ones had to die. The whole generation had to die because they were not worthy to walk into the promised land. Everyone except for Caleb and Joshua. Look at that. Caleb and Joshua. And then guess who they wanted? When they went into the land, you know, they had gone over there into the land and they said, oh, look at all this stuff here. Guess what Joshua and Caleb wanted? When they came back, remember, you go over to Israel and you see Joshua and Caleb carving these little things and they'll have this great big clump, cluster of grapes between them. You've seen these little carvings out of olive wood or whatever. They sell this over there. It's one of the tourist things. Joshua and Caleb. When they got back, they said, uh, "There's the land is flowing with milk and honey. And the rest of the spies, what did they say? There's giants, giants in the land. Guess who Joshua and Caleb, guess who they, where, where they wanted to go? Where did, what land did they want? The land where the giants were. They were going to go whip the giants, and they were old. Now, just think about that for a while. These old guys, they said, don't just let me, we just don't want to walk in the land. We want to go where the giants live. Where was that? Well, it was Canaan, all right, but where was it specifically? They're still fighting down there today. It's where Abraham's buried. Well, it's, yeah, but that's not. But if you go back and you look in this area, you're going to find it's near the cave of Machpelah, Hebron. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Around Hebron, that's where they that's where they wanted because they were some big people there. They were some large, large people. They said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. All right. That's where they went. And they got their area, didn't they? And that's also where Abraham was buried. And now they're fighting over that today. I've been, I've been right down there to the cave of Machpelah. Anybody been here? You've been over there? It's a cave in Machpelah. That's all right. They've got little... There's down in a cave. Nobody goes down there as far as I know. But right up above, every, wherever one of these places are where the Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of those people were buried, there's coffins up above, golden coffins in this place. All right, to this day. Anyway, that's where they wanted to go. They wanted that land. Now, God gave the law to Israel. And the law was supposed to do what? Well, from that perspective right back then. What was it supposed to do? They, it'll show them here their humanity, their Adamic nature, and to bring them to God through sacrifices because they couldn't do it. Now, the Jewish people, they're anciently, here, we have a division even back then. We have the beginning of uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, beginning way back in that period of time before Jesus came. Now, the Pharisees had about, uh, I think it was about 700 more laws than God gave, if I remember. I can't remember the exact number. They had a whole lot more laws than God did. It wasn't enough. They thought that they could do more than what God than God required. They say they didn't know something like 636 laws because they just every itty bitty little thing that he told them to do from the donkey to the maid servant to the so they've had them up and even today a, a modern Jew that, that you know studies whether he's orthodox or conservative he'll tell you there's 636 laws and there's no way you can keep them all. yeah well they couldn't but the Pharisees they were an elite what's the word Pharisee mean yeah. separate oh, yeah. divided they were set aside now the Apostle Paul, which name his name was Saul, okay? His name was Saul. What does Saul mean for? What's it, what's his name mean? Huh? Saul. The word shield comes from that, doesn't it? Well, Saul is how you sit in here. Uh-huh. Yeah. What's, what, the name, the place asked about. Saul means the one asked for. All right. 
the one asked for. When Israel wanted a uh, king, they asked for one. So God said, you asked for it, I'm going to give it to you. There's asked for right there. Isn't that beautiful how God plays on words? <clears throat> All right. Ask for. Are you, are you learning a little Hebrew tonight? Just a little bit, a little roots and things? <laughs> well, you'll find out that a lot of them, they will carry it out and do all kinds of things with it. But when you get back in the, in the, to Hebrew, a lot of it, the Hebrew language, the vocabulary is limited. You chase one word and it's going to mean a thousand things. The bar. The bar. Word of the Lord. Well, it means a, a fence post. It means soldiers standing in a row. It means all these things. It, it means something that's lined up. But it's also the Word of God. One word after the other lined up. The Word of the Lord. Under the bar. The Word of the Lord. All right. Well, let's go on. God gives the law. The law is supposed to bring Israel to God. And it's supposed to be humbling. All right? It's supposed to be humbling. On the Day of Atonement, they were humbled, weren't they? Yeah. Day of Atonement. They were humbled. Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. All right? The day of what? Covering of their sins. Now, your name from the Hebrews, on the Day of Atonement, either your name is in the Book of the Living or the Book of the Dead. All right, the book of the living or the book of the dead? Talk about the books. You know, when when Jesus came along, he had all these customs he, he gave them. And in the 20th chapter of Revelation, what did we study this morning? The books were opened. The books were opened. All right. The Jews knew exactly what it's called. The scrolls were unrolled. All right. All right, let's get back to to Genesis, the 22nd chapter, where I started a while ago. And verse 1, it says, Now it came about, after these things, that God, uh, what's it say there? Tested Abraham. Said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, uh, Take your only son, Isaac. What does Isaac mean? Isaac. Isaac. Laughter. Laughter. Yeah. I think. Uh, Jacob, you're thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, laughter because she laughed. Yeah, he laughed. All right. All right. Laughter because they laughed at the promises of God. You take this child now and you go to Moriah and offer him there for a bone offering on one of the mountains of which I, I'll show you when you get there. All right. Where is this place today? Which one? This is Moriah. On Mount Moriah? Mm-hmm. Where is it? Right under, the dome of the rock. right under the Dome of the Rock. It is the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. That's where Moriah is. Okay, This is where Abraham offered Isaac. Now, if you're an Arab, this is where Abraham uh, did not offer Isaac. He, he actually went over there in, uh, in the Holy Holy Land, over there in Mecca, and uh, he offered him over there. He offered uh, Ishmael as a sacrifice over there. So they say this isn't doesn't work here. But let's go and see what the Word of God says. Not what Mohammed said. Take up your only son, go over the mountains. And he said, uh, so Abraham, what did he do? He got up early in the morning. He saddled up his donkey and took two of his young men and Isaac, his son, and split wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. Actually, the place where God had showed him. Okay, and God showed him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from a distance. That word to see there is very important. The word see is very important. And Abraham said to his young, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there, and we shall worship, and we shall return to you. Both of them is plural. We are going to this. We are going to go over there and worship, and we're going to come back. Now, we know in the, in the New Testament that God offered, was going to offer up his son Isaac and God expected him to raise him from the dead if he killed him. We know that from the New Testament tells us that. We don't know it here, but in the New Testament, the Lord told us this. And Abraham took the wood of the, of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took his hand in his hand the fire and the knife 
And the two of them walked together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, Father. And he said, Yes, son. And he said, Behold, I see the fire. Again, I see the fire. I see the fire. Where is the lamb for the offering? And verse 8, And Abraham said, God will see to it. The word see again. God shall see to it. God shall see to it. For himself. Middle voice. God shall see to it for himself. Now, a long time ago, that term was used a lot. Somebody would ask you for something, I want this, daddy, whatever. I said, I'll see to it later. I'll take care of it later. That's, this is an old idiom. So what's the difference between provide and... We're going to find out. <laughs> it's beautiful in Hebrew. All right? And they came to the place which God told Abraham, and he built the altar there, and he arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac, and laid on him the laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of Jehovah called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, raised his eyes. Okay? Eyes. He saw. And he caught, saw a ram caught in the thicket by its his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son in Zeth, as a substitute for his son. Alright? And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord shall see to it. Jehovah Jireh. Now, if you go and you look up this, it's talking about the seed to it. The Lord shall see to it. Not only does it say the Lord shall see to it, but the Lord was seen now Jesus in the New Chap in the New Testament Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees in the New Testament and they're having an argument all the way from the eighth to the tenth chapter basically from the sixth chapter on some places there and uh, he told them that uh, That the Lord, that Abraham was delighted to see his day. You know, he said, you say you know Abraham and you're not even 50 years old. How do you know Abraham? He said, Abraham saw me and he was delighted. Why was Abraham delighted to see Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ? Because he was going to slay his son and then he provided the lamb. The Lord saw to it and was seen both. Both of those. That's a double word. Saw to it and was seen at the same time. All right. My Hebrew teacher taught me this. After the NAS, says, and it's the same concept as the Lord will. Mine says, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. And um, in it, the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. So it shall be seen. You know, it's yeah. provided and everything. That's a great concept. But see to it. Yeah, that's what it means. See to it. Yeah, right, again, yeah that's there. right. It's the see. That's right. The Lord shall it was seen, and the Lord shall see to it, or the Lord shall provide. He shall see to it. All right. That's a beautiful word in Hebrew. How many have you ever heard anybody tell this in Hebrew before like this? Yeah. Well, yeah. But but to be seen and to see to it. All right. So now you got something. Yeah. There's beautiful. And that's what makes the Bible easy. We did the book of Genesis about two or three times. We went all the way through when I was studying Hebrew. Six years of Hebrew. So we went to Genesis and we studied Ezekiel and Daniel and all kinds of stuff. But we went to the deep meanings of this. And what I'm sharing to you is what J. Lewis Guthrie shared with, with Travis Hubbard and, and was handed down to us. And they were contemporaries with John A. Broadus and A.T. Robertson. All right. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord shall see to it. As it is said to this day, in the mouth of the Lord, he was seen. The Lord was seen. All right. So that's where he saw him. 
And uh, then the angel of the Lord called uh, Abraham a second time from heaven. And he says, uh, I by myself have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, and I will greatly bless you and you will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. That's a very beautiful promise right there. This is still the promise of the land of Canaan, isn't it? This is the one. They were their enemies. And they over there today, all these Arabs today, they say they're sons of Abraham, which they are. But who owns the land? What's the oldest land document in the world? Right here. In this chapter of the book of Genesis. Right here. Can I ask you a quick question? I think you see, I've heard lots of different things, but tell me yours. Why does he say your son, your only son? He's got another son who's 14 now. I was probably about 7, somewhere in the right, or I got it backwards, but... Ishmael was his first son. Yes. So why, I mean, All right, God rejected Ishmael. He was going to bless him, but he rejected him, didn't he? He was rejected as the heir. Now, this is the only son. Now, when Abraham, you have to realize that when Abraham... Why do all the significant father-son relationships have the firstborn son rejected. Yes. The rejection of the firstborn. You'll see that in the Bible. Write that down someplace. The first time you're born, you're born in death. The second time you're born, you're born unto life. Okay? The substitutionary thing. God makes a substitute. Now, when I want you to understand this. I'm not going to run you much longer than this. All right? But when God called Abraham out, he had a wife. Her name was Sarah, all right? Sarah, which meant princess, all right? Now, when he added that H in her name, it meant princess of many, all right? Now, when he called Abraham out, now, Sarah had an Egyptian handmaiden. Egypt is what in the Bible? A type of what? The type of the world. Okay? It's a type of our Adamic nature. Now, God promised Abraham a divine promise that his seed would possess the land of Palestine. All right? Or the land of Canaan, literally. Now, he didn't tell him who he would have the son by. Now, they thought that Sarah's womb was shut up. Sarah hadn't had any children. She was old. All right? Abraham, now, Abraham was very capable of fathering children, wasn't he? Well, he had a bunch of them. Now, after she died, he had some more. After Sarah, he had more children. And there was just more trouble. (laughs) All right? Every one of his children outside of Sarah was a curse to the promised child. Religious persecution. Again, we're studying church history. Religious history now. All right? Every one of them was a curse. But Ishmael was rejected by God. And Sarah says now, or Sarah, I should say, she told Abraham, Abraham, I haven't had any children. Now, Hagar is my possession. If you have a child by Hagar, it is my child. And so, whoever this child, this is going to be your heir. You know, uh, Abraham was going to appoint one of his servants as heir, wasn't he? Before that, he thought he didn't have an heir. So he, the one that sent, that he sent for his son to find the wife. You know, when when Isaac, he sent her back home, and he sent this servant back over there. Can't think of his name right now. But uh, he sent that servant back there, and that's the one that he was going to give his heirship. He was going to give all of that to him. But Sarah had a real good idea. Instead of giving it to this guy, why don't you just have a child that is of your own seed by Hagar, and we'll have a child. This will be the this will be the promised son. So he did, and she did, and they have a child. But it wasn't the right child. This had to be a miracle child. There are miracle children in the Bible, aren't there? Quite a few of them. Yeah, even Acer, yeah. Damascus. 
Eliezer, that's who he was going to give her everything he had to. Go back and study that carefully. You'll find all this down there. I had to do this word for word in Hebrew, see. That's why I've you well, know, you when you study it word for word, translate it word for word. Uh, we've studied the Gospel of John, the book of Revelation, first and second Peter, first and second Thessalonians, and uh, the book of Jude, and now the book of James, Ephesians, and uh, Colossians. Now we know those words, those books, as we studied in my class, word for word. Now when you study the Bible word for word and you translate them every word, you will see some beautiful things in there. I think we ought to study each word of the Lord. That's very important. All right. Anyway, the promised son. They had the son. And then God appeared again to Abraham. There at the Oaks, Mama. And he told him, he said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gorar down there and all this kind of stuff. Oh, by, by the way, you're going to have a son now. Already got one. Don't need one. <laughs> I got a son. No, you don't. That's the son of the world. How disappointed Abraham must have been. How disappointed Abraham must have been. You know, Abraham still wasn't totally converted yet, was he? He was a man of faith, but he wasn't totally converted. God had called him out and he knew, he would, knew what he would do. But he... Uh, <clears throat> He told him, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a son. And you show. And she laughed. She heard it. She laughed. And he laughed. If you really look at the word real good, both of them laughed. And you shall name his name, you shall call his name Isaac or Laughter. Because you both laughed. You laughed at the promise of God because you were too old. But she was too old. She had already gone through her cycles of a woman and she was not going to have any children. She was old. Close to 90 years old, actually. That's old. You know, regardless. She was still beautiful, but she was old. She couldn't have a child. But God quickened, livened, put life in her dead womb, it says. And she conceived and she had this child. And his name was Isaac. Well, here was the promise of Now, everything, every child that Abraham ever had before or after Isaac would be a curse to Isaac. And this is all religious persecution. Those sons, one of them would jump up by the name of Mohammed in the 500s. And he would combine all of them together and we would have the problem that we got over there in the Middle East today. Religious persecution. Religious persecution. Now we're going to uh, study some more of this next week. Did you learn anything tonight? I don't have time all the time in the Sunday school class to teach you some of the things I'm teaching you. Now we're going to get right into church history real soon because we're just about there, aren't we? Alright? We're just about into the church history and then we're going to study the evolution of religion. The evolution of religion as we see it. And we're going to understand some of the things that we practice today is pure hogwash. <laughs> and some of the things that we stood for Baptists are not Baptist principles at all. We borrowed them from the Catholic Church. <laughs> all right, we're going to get into that later on. Thank you for your attention tonight. And I hope you were blessed with God's Word. That's one thing I try to... I teach church history from the Bible mainly, as you have seen. And when we get over into the church age, we're going to study it from the Bible standpoint right off the bat. And then we'll go, go, go from there. <laughs> brother Bill, would you mind uh, dismissing us in prayer, brother?